Namaste. My guest today, Dr. Vijay Raghavan, is Principal Scientific Advisor to the Government of India. Uh, he is a well-known person. I know a lot about him. Uh, I have known him through some very common mutual friends in Princeton uh, who speak very highly of him also. And of course, he's an important person, very influential person uh, in the world of science and technology in India. So welcome, uh, Dr. Vijay Raghavan. Thank you very much, uh, Kamalhotra. This is a great uh, pleasure and an honor to be here with you today, uh, particularly in an age where you know, dramatic changes are taking place in the way we function, both physically and through various networks. So thank you very much for having me. Thank you. So uh, you, I know you have uh, gone through my book on artificial intelligence and the future of power. Uh, so I thought a good way to start would be to you know, hear your comments on the book and your, uh, your views on it, uh, your issues with it, uh, where you agree, disagree. Uh, we'll, have a, we'll have an open, candid conversation. I would love to hear from you. Well, uh, thank you very much. And thank you for uh, writing this book because you know, it comes with a very different perspective from the standard uh, artificial intelligence books. It's not that those are unimportant, but those come from a perspective which is dominated by the steady growth of technology and its use and its application. Um, and you bring in, in your book, a whole range of other perspectives also about not just what the technology is, but not only how it relates to jobs, but then how agency and self relate to that. And you've looked at it from the context both of uh, both individuals, collectiveness, as well as countries and you know, digital uh, uh, you know, ownership and what democracy means. I think these are very important approaches. One feature which comes out uh, in many aspects, studying artificial intelligence from uh, Western studies, is a dominance of how um, narrow artificial intelligence is becoming more and more prevalent and valuable in a variety of ways, how data sets and their access can you know, make that better and better. And the whole approach is substantially about how public good can come out of it with concerns raised by ethicists, by you know, activist groups and so on about the use or misuse of privacy and data. So that's the dominant theme over there. It misses a point which you bring out very well that what does it mean for you know, large democracies who may not have immediate access to the technology in its entirety, but also when the ownership of the technology is narrower and narrower, and people are told increasingly what is good for them, and perhaps they're told in a correct way what is good for them in their practical lives, in their day-to-day -day lives, then what is the role of you know, free will and decision-making and agency in that context? If everything which you need to know is told by various people on the basis of data they collect, what does, you know, what do, what does agency mean in that context? And I think that's brought out as a topic for discussion uh, quite well. So I'll leave it at this right now. There are many other things which I'd like to bring in, but this is my sort of first uh, pass. Excellent. So this is actually my most favorite point. And I'm so glad that you picked it up because I'll tell you the more obvious things people uh, talk about, uh, you know, uh, about jobs and about uh, security, weapons and all that, they're already being talked about. And, and, and uh, maybe my view is a little different, but at least the issue is not anything novel. The issue is already there. However, this point about uh, what is AI doing with respect to human mind and human psychology, both good and bad, is I think the heart of my uh, problem that I'm trying to grapple here. Uh, so I see that uh, uh, the machine learning is understanding our psychology in some ways better than we understand ourselves, better than our close relatives even understand us. Uh, then mm -hmm. it's able to use this psychology to model 
uh, you know, cause effect. What are we likely, how are we likely to react? Are we likely to click here or click there? Uh, and what kind of a thing should they send to have a higher probability of being clicked? So gamifying us in a sense, uh, you know, and that by gamifying us, uh, mo- uh, able to modify our behavior, and this can be done individually. It can also be done qual- collectively for a group of people. Uh, and then, uh, then taking it even further and having fake, deep fakes, uh, you can not only make a, a video uh, of uh, Rajiv Malhotra or Vijay Raghavan that is not, uh, people cannot tell, people who know us cannot tell whether it's real or fake voice. You can have voice messages. You can have text uh, with natural language processing. They're writing, te- writing editorials. Uh, as though it's written by a certain person, such that even the chief editor of the newspaper cannot tell if this is real or fake. I mean, the the AI is getting smarter. So uh, this, of course, raises a lot of issues. I mean, there, of course, it is very exciting for a technocrat. Uh, we are both technocrats, so we think it's fun. But you know, there are also social responsibility issues that it brings. So one of the things I wanted to ask you is, when they say. Uh, a way to solve privacy and Indian laws that I've, uh, Indian, uh, the proposals also mentioned this. One way that they th- think is very effective is anonymize it, uh, it, it make the data anonymous. So uh, my, my uh, counter to that is that even if the data, does, even if the data about uh, Dr. Vijay Raghavan doesn't say it is him, it just gives a number. And the data about Rajiv also says it's just a number. Uh, you you can get collective intelligence about a group of a group behavior, and you can so for instance let's let's take a recent example. Suppose there is uh, uh, somebody monitoring all the uh, farmers that are uh, having some revolt or riot or a protest, or it could be people in the U.S. capital, all the people who are in the U.S. capital, or it could be somebody in China and the Chinese government is doing surveillance. So whatever the particular group may be. Or it could be an enemy's army. Their military is talking to each other and you are able to eavesdrop. So if you are able to eavesdrop the conversations, then there is something called sentiment analysis, as you know, which can which can figure out what's the sentiment of these people. Are they happy? Are they sad? Are they about to revolt and become violent? Are they scared? Uh, in other words, when you know the group psychology, it's great for you, for somebody wanting to deal with them. Because if you know real time, what's the sentiment of these people, then what kind of action you should take, you have an advantage, as opposed to not knowing their sentiment. And this sentiment analysis uh, picked up from uh, the conversations, uh, natural language processing used to figure out the meaning of what they're saying. Uh, this has nothing to do with individual privacy, because I could, I could at the edge at the edge where I'm capturing the data, I could remove the individual uh, names and yet get this benefit. So here is an example of uh, big data being usable for benefit to uh, be- get the better of a society, even to defeat them without violating uh, individual privacy. Uh, and another example would be that uh, the, the study of uh, diverse big data allows you to develop algorithms to solve problems, to make better drugs and medicines, to uh, do better agriculture, because you know all the big data of various farmers. And even if you anonymize it, you make the data completely anonymous, uh, but you can make intellectual property out of it without giving them the benefit of any share. And and, uh, you can say, look, I, I honored your privacy. So these are two examples. One is to compromise the society and the other is to d- develop some intellectual property for your own benefit uh, that you can then go back and license back to them. Uh, in both cases, I've constructed a scenario where no privacy is violated. So it seems that the issues, the laws on privacy that are being discussed fall short. Absolutely. Um, you know, they do fall short and they fall short in ways which are uh, you know, difficult to fathom if you look at the current situation alone in terms of masses of data and illustrated by the many approaches to handling that data. So let us step back a little bit and leave the technolo- uh, technological capabilities and the shock and awe that it brings aside for a moment. And let us imagine a group of people who are conducting some oct- uh, activity, a small group, And let us imagine that another group has got access 
completely to all what they're saying and doing. You know, this is uh, a classical, uh, say, medieval spy situation. You know, someone in the emperor's, uh, you know, cabinet listening to everything and then going back and reporting. Now, the difference in that complete knowledge which comes from that case is that it also looks at the cultural and social nuances interpreting that conversation. And that's analyzed by human minds who, you know, then take complicated decisions, which are not necessarily always dictated by probabilities of success as decided by looking at hundreds of thousands of similar contexts and looking at outcomes. In other words, the human capacity, which may be called artificial general intelligence at some time, transcends the ability of narrow intelligence to analyze data more and more. And that comes from two aspects. One, the nature of our brains, the biology, but also a strong cultural tradition and rooting of a variety of kinds which allow more complex decision making. So in that situation, you know, the more and more we address privacy issues in a more machine oriented manner, we miss the point that there will always be roots which have linked the machine to the cultural moorings, which can bypass the restrictions which are placed by machines. In other words, privacy will be broken by multiple other routes which make human oriented guesswork, which is much more astute than the machine alone. So we are, we are in a very complicated situation. Yes. We have access to all kinds of information and humans can not only use machines, but they will use cultural context to make decisions on that. I fully agree with this, but you know, in my book, uh, I consider uh, cultural decoding by machine learning also within the purview of AI. Uh, I Absolutely. mean, I feel yeah. that uh, not as sophisticated as, uh, you know, the, the uh, completely general case, but I would say that uh, a, a machine learning, unsupervised learning, figuring out that this culture, absolutely, now, yes, the yes, news yes. is the news is something uh, same for everybody in Bangalore, let's say. Uh, but this community in Bangalore versus that community in Bangalore, how are they reacting differently? Is it to do with gender, culture, social status, caste, whatever? So uh, I think that uh, uh, figuring out, learning through experience. Uh, the cultural nuances uh, uh, that are likely to result in behavioral, uh, behavioral response uh, is something that machine learning is becoming smarter and smarter at. And I think this is what the Chinese are up to in a big way. And I would say this is also what the Google and Facebook and Twitter are up to in a big way, because, you know, Google, these uh, American uh, uh, digital giants, as I call them, or digital devatas, some of them, I, I call them the, the new devatas, they, they have the ability to figure out that uh, based on some news last night, what's the reaction in this village versus that state versus people who are, uh, you know, high class versus uh, poor people, they, they can tell a, a huge amount. So the cultural patterns, socioeconomic patterns, how they are different, machines are picking that up. And while I agree with you that the human judgment uh, is still something beyond the reach of the machine, so far. But the machine compensates by having access to larger number and, and knowing the histories of these people for a long time. I wouldn't know the history of 10,000 uh, protesters in the US no. capital or the farmers or wherever. I would not know their detailed history, their family life, and I would not be able to correlate so much. The machine can do some things I can't, and I can do certain things the machine cannot. So this is this is the situation we're in. No, I mean, we're also in an interesting situation that, you know, in our human interactions, we make extraordinary decisions on the basis of very sparse data. We come in with priors of various kinds, assumptions about people, cultures, ourselves, others. And we, you know, we'll take extraordinary decisions based on that. And then, you know, if those priors work out, we uh, go ahead. If they don't, then we change our views, uh, which is very different from analyzing masses of data and you know pulling out needles from that haystack, which computers increasingly are able to do. Humans don't 
might conclude the same kinds of decisions, uh, to, to, to come to the same kinds of positions, but they come in very different ways. And this interface is very interesting now to see how much increasing trust there is, quote unquote trust, in what machines tell us what is valuable compared to the way we think and make uh, uh, judgments. We walk into a room, we see six people, and we you know, look at their facial expressions, where they are from, and we have views about them. Uh, machines might come to the same views, but they come with you know, a huge amount of data uh, and analysis to reach that. Yeah, now, now, you know, a few years ago, see, when I was, uh, many years ago, 50 years ago, uh, when I was a graduate student, uh, we were doing, trying to do uh, chess programs and all that. Uh, and then later in my career, we were trying to do handwriting analysis, speech recognition, shapes, trying to understand shapes. And now, of course, it's uh, all, it's, uh, the system is so sophisticated. Now, we could not have, when I was a younger, young fellow, we could not have imagined that machines will outsmart humans in facial recognition because we used to think that there is something special about a person. Maybe he's smiling, not smiling. Maybe he's got glasses. Maybe he's got a cap, but I can still recognize who the person is. The point is machine can not only do that, it can, it can recognize the person when, the, when it's dark, when human being can't even see. And, and if in a big stadium with tens of thousands of people, it can pick up this fellow. So the ability, and then, you know, machines can pick up uh, tumors or medical diagnosis better than radiologist with his eyes. Radiology may be obsolete now. So uh, machines have hacked certain human capabilities where we used to think that it is sacrosanct and only a human being has that potential. So there is a, there is a, it's a bit humbling. Uh, you know, it's a bit humbling. And I have in this book, one of the things I talk about is consciousness versus intelligence. Because a lot of people have, a lot of computer scientists I know well and respect well, I think have made the wrong conclusion that machines cannot be uh, in intelligent, cannot beat humans in intelligence because they're not conscious. And my argument is that being conscious is not a requirement for so many things. Uh, you, you know, <laughs> if and, and if a if a driver loses his job to a driverless car, it doesn't matter whether the driverless car is conscious or not. The point is, I lost my job. Yeah, yeah. So the the yeah. practical impact has nothing to do with consciousness. So it seems that since machines have gone so fast in this AI is moving so fast, there are fewer and fewer domains left where a person could say that you know I'll outsmart the machine. And, and the machine is, no matter how, who has the AI advantage, I can counter it. So this means that somehow the AI is winning uh, in, in more and more spheres, uh, certainly in the sphere of hard power, uh, economics, military, all of these things. And so, um, so the, here my question is, one of the things that instigated me to write this is I was very disappointed that India gave away a lot of big data at the Kumbhela. At the Kumbhela. I know, you mentioned that. I, I, I wrote uh, a lot of papers, did a lot of videos, got lakhs of views, uh, saying that this Harvard project and all these guys, they're saying mapping the Kumbh Mela, they're making it so clear. They're saying we, are, we want to understand the human rights issues, the gender issues. So they want to, uh, they're, they're collecting uh, DNA from people. Uh, they're building a map of you know up to 100 million people, where they come from in India, who came by train, how they came, what was their experience. Huge amount of data being captured uh, in, in, at a, without even concern for privacy, not even trying to anonymize it. So down to the village <laughs> level, they know what is going on uh, with 100 million people up to that much. Uh, and in, nobody in India bothered. Nobody, no law against it. The minister is very happy that, you know, we are being studied by Harvard. Wow, the Devata has come, so we must be special, you know. And so then Harvard published a two, three volume series on mapping the Kumbh Mela. Uh, and they brought the, a lot of the state level ministers, maybe some central ministers also. And they were very proud that Harvard is studying us. So I was very upset. I went to the Akhara Parishad. They are the Naga Sadhus. They are, they, they are the ones who are the real keepers of the Kumbh Mela. And the head of that, I explained it to him that this surveillance will result in uh, social scientists passing judgment on what's right and wrong about the Kumbh Mela and then maybe some international activism. So I got quite concerned. A lot of activism ha happened. But then I was very disappointed that uh, they not only ignored all my stuff, but they actually welcomed the... Uh, 
they announced that all these uh, universities, foreign uh, uh, researchers are welcome to come and study the Kumbh Mela, give us advice and so on. Now, isn't this an example where our people have not understood that this is big data? We have on the one hand brains, AI brains who know big data is, is very special and we should not just give it away. But on the other hand, the people are making policy that, you know, you can come with, uh, with cameras and do facial recognition on lakhs and millions of people have not, it has not registered that that kind of data is also big data. It doesn't have to be machine readable. It can be, it can be data, just collecting data about uh, what people are saying in a, in a bazaar. That's also big data. So what do you think of this gap in uh, enforcing the big data? I mean, there is big data laws coming. But in terms of in practical examples, as, as the example I just gave, there is a kind of way giving it away. You know, um, I'll address the issue of big data laws uh, sh shortly. And, but just to say that those kinds of laws are likely to be well thought out, but not necessarily well connected with the implementation and ability to implement and may not capture the spirit of the kinds of issues which you're saying. Uh, so that is one. But more fundamentally, I think you've touched on a very important uh, set of gaps in our society, which is being bridged now, but uh, needs to be bridged faster and better. And that's the gap between those who have extraordinary capability, but poor connectivity, and those who have extraordinary connectivity but are oblivious to these rapid changes which are going on. So this is a very peculiar Indian situation. You have, you know, I'm not giving values to each component, but you have a France and Germany on one hand and a very different world in another, mm. in a salt and pepper mix. The pepper is the elite. And no matter how much you pour water on the salt and pepper mix, the elite will never mix with the salt. So. It is the elite, and I don't mean this necessarily in a pejorative sense, people who rule us, people who take decisions, who are well-meaning, who understand these laws and these aspects, their rootedness needs to increase. And correspondingly, the understanding of technologies at a deep level needs to be there amongst people at large. And that's both of these are immense challenges and I will elaborate a little bit on how I think it can be done. Please. But in your book, you touched aspects of that from a practical point of view in looking at um, and Chandrasekhar's book, The Brigital uh, Nation, about how you know that transition and application to right. can take place. And those have values, uh, but also fundamentally, we need to have this transition in terms of knowledge and the power of abstraction. And unless that goes broadly, to the people at large, you're going to have an asymmetry between those who have knowledge and power on one side and those who don't have power because they don't have this new knowledge coming. Right, right. So, you know, in if you look at examples of uh, big data that are uh, not so uh, abstract like say Kumbh Mela people, you know, but you look at big data that should be clearly big data. So there's recently, actually, two days ago on 60 Minutes, this famous 60 Minutes show, uh, it was on um, China's surveillance and capturing of big data around the world. China's DNA theft. They were These guys were really after China. And so they said that China, and they gave an example of a company called BMI, that is, uh, that is uh, capturing DNA, and China's goal is to capture the DNA of as many human beings around the world as possible. Because from this, they can do drug discovery, they can do all kind of mischief, they can uh, uh, do predictions, they can do all kind of things. This is the final, uh, one of the ultimate assets uh, for, uh, for, for a country to own. And China is owning it. And so they feature this one company, Chinese company, and it goes to various places and tries to, and offers to do DNA analysis. Uh, they, they offer to do, you know, a whole lot of... Uh, work uh, behind the, the back office work for DNA, uh, DNA type work for in different countries. And they, they said that the US government is now very alarmed. So I looked up BMI India, just to see if they're in India. And sure enough, they are doing, uh, uh, you know, gene sequencing. So, uh, you know, here we are, 
debating <laughs> data data laws and here there is a company now you see banning tiktok is sort of very high profile okay i i fully agree it should be it should be banned because they do have that kind of ability and it can be misused but you know that is sort of popular level everybody kind of gets uh, shaken up there okay big one like tiktok got banned but this is a company not known to the public it's a business to business it's a technology company working with pharma people and uh, various so and so on but it should have been on the scanner i mean there may be several companies like that that are uh, picking up a very very specialized data from india uh, and siphoning it off to somebody so what is the what is isn't there a concern about that that we have theoretically we are th in the in the theory sense we are doing a good job debating all these data laws and so on but in practice we are not uh, implementing there are so many leaks now this is a very uh, interesting and important point and let me um, metaphorically um, give you a perspective on a completely different set of big data now if you look at um, you know satellites remote sensing collecting earth data now they fly beyond your uh, you know air uh, uh, territorial range and so it's perfectly legal what they do and increasingly satellites of any country can take extremely detailed pictures of any other country right uh and you know this is going to an incredible level of detail so many of these kinds of points which you said which are non interventionist can be uh, taken in some ways initially this was a matter of big concern uh how does one do this but the democratization of this access in other words you can collect my data but i can also collect your data changes the perspective of this data rather substantially in other words when you have the power of technology you have a greater preventive role of its misuse by of similar technologies being misused by others in your area because you are also doing the same thing and there is a, a balance over there uh, that is now the challenge for these other kinds of data you suggest and therefore the answer may not be entirely in stopping or not stopping because there will be multiple routes to access the data for example if you say that human data from india should not be accessible but you find that machine learning and ai can access emigration data uh, people who have emigrated and get much the same kinds of context in a variety of ways as a, maybe as an approximation but over there so what we are missing perhaps and i'm not i'm not fully i'm not insisting that i'm not saying that i'm right here but one root is that our capability to collect and analyze data on scale needs to be there and with our large young demography you know having a very strong rootedness on one side and an ability to deal and use these technologies on the other will be transformative otherwise you will be in a situation where this elite will be collecting this data as a service for people all over the world you refer to that in your book but not for uh, the country itself yes uh, and that uh, broadening of this capacity is needed you know i've done a lot of uh, research especially on what china is up to around the world and in this book i gave a brief example of zimbabwe uh, where china has a deal where they supply tens of thousands of surveillance cameras to keep the government secure but actually the, all the data goes to china so while they are keeping this particular re regime secure they are also keeping them on track and they are they are they got a gun on their head same as british east india company would keep the raja secure because he's their friend and he's a uh, you know but the moment he steps out of line they know all his secrets they know his dirty secrets they know how to compromise him whose enemies are where he's vulnerable his scandals all that so china has done doing this with pakistan in a very big way china is doing this with africa in a very big way so your point that there is a there is a like what uh, 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 kissinger coined the term nuclear term mu mutually assured destruction mad mad means that okay the reason we won't kill each other is that i, I could destroy you you can destroy me so we're in balance however in this case the theoretical capability is equal on both sides but in practice the african country cannot do this to china 
I mean, they cannot do this. To, they cannot do this to China. What China can do to the Africans? Pakistan cannot respond by saying, "Okay, you got all the data on Pakistanis, and we got all the data on Chinese," because Pakistan got no capability. So my feeling is that um, there is also a practicality issue of asymmetry of power. That some people have more power and the ability to use this, collect the data, and use it than the other way around. So what the 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 asymmetry of power in collecting data and the, the know how to use it, the real time and how sophisticated the algorithms are. You know, Chinese have been perfecting their algorithm not only on their Muslim minority but also Hong Kong, Hong Kong, and they are uh, all the all the demonstrators in Hong Kong. They're collecting the big data and looking at behavior profiles and get uh, and they are doing this for various governments that are almost like colonies of China. so they have collected they've got a huge amount of uh, experience in how to how to uh, do swarm intelligence the intelligence of a swarm of people and how to predict them and and gamify them how to uh, so this is something i would say is a threat that other countries have to i know us intelligence people talk about it and they are concerned that china has got this kind of an advantage this this issue really comes down whether one is talking about uh you know different kinds of uh balance of power whether one has capabilities in those realms or not just as you know historically in the 19th century 18th century you looked at you know your ability to resist uh invasions or attacks because you had forces to balance that and capabilities that was matched by guerrilla capabilities uh, intelligence and so on similarly analogously in the digital world all these translate they have to be there so there is no protection without capability and to have only a protectionist measure without capability will not succeed because it's a ever changing situation yes. there's no way you can protect by purchasing that capability yes. because then you know this is true of every generation you can purchase some things but you cannot purchase everything then you'd be weak and these are the kinds of standard balances which one needs to address so this takes me to the next issue because the i both i agree with you what's important is let's build our capability rather than complaining that they have capability and trying to block it because we won't succeed they'll do whatever they'll do and we should do whatever we can do so regarding capability india was the software superpower but we did not get into ai the way china did we did not invest the easy money from wage arbitrage we kept making money you know we made a lot of billionaires and they are very big shots i mean i know some of them i respect them but they they took the advantage of it but they did not reinvest the way china did china had also had wage arbitrage with factory workers uh, you know but they they while they sold cheap labor to the americans they also took this money and they reinvested in futurist technologies so they are number one in solar they have the largest robotics uh, you know installed base and technology in battery technology they own half the lithium supply of the world and most of the patents uh, in in they're catching up very rapidly with the west in semiconductors they're really uh, advanced in uh, quantum computing so these are some of the areas that india is not uh, technologically so when you say we need the capability earlier you said we should have the capability the atmanirbhar project uh, has a, is a, is very strategic but atmanirbhar has been interpreted to mean manufacturing not research so we are we are self aspiring to be self sufficient in make in india but not make the knowledge in india so you know we are now we are, we are getting a lot we are licensing a lot of lithium ion and uh, technology to make uh, battery uh, cars for electric uh, you know uh, batteries for electric cars uh, we are bring, do, uh, trying to do a whole lot of uh, semiconductors we get most of the significant semiconductor work done overseas so do you feel that uh, lagging in strategic research is an issue because i keep hearing a lot of people in india saying it's not an issue because we can license and buy what we need to i feel that whatever you buy will be one or two generations behind what they got <laughs> and 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 See, they can my... also stop it any time so what do you, what is your thought on r and d atmanirbhar in r and d 
See, there are, uh, this is a very uh, critical point. And there are two schools of thoughts one can imagine. One can say, look, you have to raise the standards of living of our people rapidly. Why do you want to spend resources? Some people might argue, and I think they argue wrongly. Why do you want to spend resources on research to development? All these things have been worked out. Why not just buy them? Once we become well-to-do, then we can worry about basic research. Basic research takes decades. Uh, what chance do you have, they argue, of catching up on basic research? My answer to that is, it depends on the name of your country. If your name of your country is Liechtenstein, nothing against Liechtenstein, it's a perfectly valid argument. Uh, buy everything um, and you know, uh, deal with basic research in a very modest way. For good or for worse, this is not the name of a country. It is a different name and a different country. And there is really no option for two reasons. One is the assumption that technology is culture and location agnostic, right? Is something which is fundamentally a problem. I agree. Um, you know, it has got enormous local implications. And therefore, even if you buy things, you're buying things with all the bells and whistles made for a very different context. Yes. It will work. But, you know, there's no point buying a Ferrari and running it on certain kinds of roads. Uh, you know, so these are, these are not technology. And that's what we will be doing metaphorically in many different kinds of things if you purchase. You'll be overpaying and undergetting. Now, that's one, one kind of technology. But fundamentally, there's another kind of problem related to the size and the complexity and the history and the you know, way we uh, are able to think and analyze. India is one of the few countries where we have scientists and engineers who can understand every single topic under the sun. They have capabilities in many areas of implementing and they can, you know, uh, use those capabilities in companies all over the world. In such a situation, if we don't invest in R&D in a manner which uses them largely for you know, a larger national good, you will have you know, uh, companies located in India disconnected with the surroundings, a short walk from India in other words, which are serving the global marketplace at a very high level but not serving the local marketplace uh, or the local population in any way. So I think we should just step back a bit and be a little calm and see what we need to do. If someone built a big aircraft, you know, and we don't do that, our ambition should not be that we must also build that big aircraft today. You know, that's an imitative ambition, which has its value, but it's not sufficient by any means. We should intelligently, intelligently analyze the landscape and say, how can we exponentially grow in areas today? And those areas today are anchored on design, you know, either in semiconductor design or a network design or you know, the kinds of areas we're talk, talking about. Design and distributed manufacturing are the key today. Both need to be done. Design capabilities in India for India can scale up enormously. You might need to still import manufacturing capabilities at the high end, but that can, you know, in a linear manner, catch up. So an exponential growth at design and implementation in every way is necessary. That's made a little easier by the availability of energy uh, in a, a large scale uh, and water uh, in a large scale and if roads come in, that will change the capacity to do high end research across the country. There will still be issues like you mentioned, we will be importing many of the components required for that energy, uh, such as lithium ion batteries or photovoltaic cells and so on. And those need to be dealt with, but there are multiple routes which India is taking now, which should address that. If we stay the path, I think, we can broaden our research base substantially. And you've also alluded to that need uh, in your book. Yeah, yeah, because you know, right now in AI, uh, so much of the brain power has gone outside India because uh, 
uh, because the opportunity to do very exciting work and a lot of money available chasing it. And the, the AI work done in, in India, largely with uh, Google India, Microsoft India. So also they're smart guys. They know that the, there are a lot of intelligent people here. Let's go set up a base there and hire them and give them good salaries and they'll be happy. So I think the the, the two reasons, I, I, I fully agree with your th th uh, emphasis on r and I really like that. Two extra, two other things I will add is that uh, India already did this with atomic energy and India already did it with space. So Baba Atomic Research and ISRO are two examples where even a poor country, when these things were started, were very poor, have uh, been have been very successful, world class, and keeping neck to neck with the best uh, practices and the best technology elsewhere in the world. And so why not something of that scale, of a BARC scale or ISRO scale for AI? And when I say AI, I mean a whole cluster of technologies, including robotics, including quantum computing, semiconductors, all that. Why not something of that scale? Because, you know, right now, the I come across scientists here, some professors there, little groups, they're doing this AI. But the advantage of an ISRO is that you make missions. You have game-changing missions. And you set milestones. By this year, we'll go to Mars. By this year, we'll do this, that, that. And, and, and then you're left alone by the politicians don't meddle with it. A good thing would be to get the bureaucrats and politicians not meddling. People in ISRO told me and people in BRC also told me when I've interviewed them. One of the success factors is that it's away from Delhi and nobody comes around for a tour and for the tamasha and all of that. And these technocrats are left alone and they define their own goals and they do very well. Something of that kind, perhaps for the type of technologies we are talking about would be great. And then you can see the second thing is the large availability of Indian manpower. Uh, it's a shame that we are training the manpower for renting it out to other people. So the business model is, you know, NASCOM says that we've got to train so many more lakh uh, people in, you know, data analytics and machine learning and all that in program, basic programming. And so that uh, uh, the, these outsourcing companies can uh, rent them out because the old uh, old brain being rented out has is obsolete. The bigger market is now for this AI brain. So basically, it's uh, training the India Indian brain for sale. I think that has to stop. We have to understand that the uh, huge treasure lies in the fact that we got the Indian brain, and this brain should not be up for sale. It should be our own R and D. And this, but this requires money. It requires serious funding, and it requires patience. Uh, but I, I am totally for it. This kind of a thing. I, I, I would agree on both points. Let me just summarize both these points and then address them. One is that we need to invest substantially in this whole range of areas, from the cyber physical to AI to supercomputing to quantum, uh, and that requires substantial investment. And secondly that this investment should be connected to national development in multiple ways and not as a service industry for, you know, at a higher level abroad. Now it so happens, and I'm so glad that you brought this up, that over the last four years, we have a major supercomputing mission, a quantum computing mission, an AI mission. Uh, and, you know, all these three have taken off already. Uh, the quantum mission is just about to take off in a very substantial manner and huge amounts of resources there. We've also got, again, this was announced at the budget today, uh, yesterday, but it's already taken off, is a natural language translation mission. And that relates to the rootedness. In other words, you're going to have this heavy investment along with the National Research Foundation, I told you, in expanding the footprint of science, but you're also going to make sure that people, for every kind of work they do, whether they're going to the courts, or to the panchayat office, or to a science university, they have access to information bilingually in their native language and in English, right? Now this allows a certain connectedness, which allows a certain power of abstraction. When all these other technologies are used, you think about how you're going to use them in the context you're experiencing. Right now, my concern about many of the high-end scientific activities we do is you're connected at a great level with your surroundings. And suddenly you jump into a new world, which is as if this technology is there without any connection here, but it's got a connection somewhere else. You know, So that uh, 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 situation where you don't break off your roots while you deal with 
cutting edge science and technology is also what is needed in addition to the huge investment you're talking about. I think it's happening. There's a greater permeation of these ideas amongst people in general. If you look at the composition of scientists uh, coming in over the last few years, they come from a much greater diversity with a greater connectedness. They don't come from only elite families. So these things are happening, but now there's an opportunity to let that happen more uh, rapidly. Now, you know, when I was, uh, when I was in the, uh, when I came to the US as a graduate student at the age of uh, 20, one of the things that really impressed me is my professors had defense contracts. And so I got to work on a Pentagon contract, uh, had get security clearance and all that. Most students, even now, in computer science and in physics and in all kind of high tech and all, uh, it's not very difficult to get some kind of a government contract, military contract, because the military industrial academic complex is very strong in the United States. And this is something I learned we don't have in India. It's also very strong in China. So the defense department, they pioneer so many things. I was uh, vice president in ITT for R&D and we had contracts, defense contracts for night goggles uh, which then became commercially commercially available 10 years later. Uh, fiber optics, a huge amount on fiber optics. Speech recognition, uh, so that the pilots could speak commands uh, without having to use their hands. So a lot of defense, you know, internet started as DARPA net, became ARPA net, became internet. And then, you know, even these driverless cars, uh, uh, DARPA uh, had this uh, competition. So the role of government and particularly military in uh, developing uh, private sector is huge. Whether it is uh, McDonnell Douglas, whether it is uh, Boeing, whether it is, uh, you know, all these companies, so many, uh, Grumman, Raytheon, these kind of uh, private, uh, huge uh, industry of uh, defense contractors. Uh, that's the military industrial complex. And then, then this, uh, with the government feeding these long-term projects that don't have short-term commercial viability, and uh, the government has to fund it. CIA funds some of these things. So while Eisenhower called it the military industrial complex, the, his term, I would add uh, academic to it. I would say the military industrial academic complex. Academic people have private sector uh, industry grants also from the pharmaceutical industry, from all kinds of industries, they'll go get grants and the graduate students will work. So these students are channeling their energy to do something practical. They're also very excited. And uh, it's not some abstract theoretical learning only. And the uh, industry gets a, a flow of a pipeline of uh, trained students that have uh, worked on these projects and they get to know them. And the government is kind of putting all this together. Now in China also, I found the military and the industry are together in, in, in wrapped up. Most of these uh, in, uh, big uh, industrialists are with the blessings and with the involvement of the People's Liberation Army. And also I found that the academics are very deeply involved in this kind of thing. I don't find this in India. I find separate silos. I think the DRDO silo industry does not have too much, too much uh, actual fundamental research going on, but whatever they have is their own. And the academic people are, you know, that so much of the academic world is just teaching and politics politics on campus and teaching, I don't see much research. And I, I, so why aren't they able to break these silos and create alliances among, you know, military, industry and academics in India? You know, um, this, what you said is very desirable to have a link between, you know, defense, the industry and academia and explore new kinds of avenues for solutions, ranging from you know, what is current artificial intelligence based solutions to various problems to also uh, various kinds of hardware. Why it is happening now increasingly, but I'll tell you what I uh, think is a fundamental reason why it took so long. And I hope it will happen at a greater pace now. Fundamentally, if you look at those countries which have a strong link between their military development, their industry and academia, they are not major importers of their defense needs. Yes. The moment you are have an option to substantially import your defense needs, then you're constantly torn between getting the latest 
with all the bells and whistles and something which is not so latest which will might do for your purpose but doesn't look as good for the future or doesn't have everything you want to have for right now and so on this creates a difference in uh, creates two kinds of ecosystems in the country those kind of you know context where you want to equip yourself right away and you want to buy to do that and the other where you want to develop for the long haul this gap is a very peculiar gap in countries like india we must celebrate at least the presence of these two schools rather than only one which imports everything you know so keep that in mind that i mean we are certainly better off and there's been some incredible advances recently but this conceptual uh, change also needs to be taken uh, take place about what is primary that the imports are temporary and are steady state i uh, will go step by step into uh, diminishing that and having capability now that others would argue that the many of the kinds of equipment which one needs are so enormously expensive to invest and develop it's going to be a tough haul there are ways of dealing with that but in today's world again pertinent to you know you title your book artificial intelligence of the future of power the future of power substantially lies in those kinds of technologies yes. where you know desi investment and success can be much more rapid yeah when you look at the history of uh, military defeats i mean uh, babur came with cannons for the first time in in the indian subcontinent land and that was a decisive factor and uh, portuguese and other europeans brought uh, these uh, ca- cannons on boats for the first time again so these were very decisive in uh, what led to uh, so much problem for india uh, and, and you know the stinger missile the american stinger missile because of the miniaturization in their semiconductors allowed a shoulder a man with a not very well educated carrying something on a shoulder to bring down a plane from 15000 feet put the entire soviet air force out of business in on in afghanistan and change the game change the game and so you could say that one of the decisive factors in bringing down the soviet empire was afghanistan and the one of the decisive things within afghanistan was that the soviet air force was grounded because these stinger missiles could shoot them down and so this is the power of a breakthrough weapon and so you know somebody who gets quantum computing can hack your uh, get through your encryption and your all your passwords and uh, security and uh, create havoc and you you shoot you send missiles towards them and they can hack and reprogram the missile send it back to you uh, give it a different gps coordinates and send it back to you so the the ability of uh, breakthrough technologies has to is so much it has to do with national sovereignty security are we going to be safe so i can see the military point of view that while this long term r and d is going to be good but you know i have a survival i have to survive doctor saying eat vitamins and do exercise and you will be healthy in the long run but then right now my heart needs a injection of something to survive <laughs> so so you know india is india in a state where uh, we will be perpetually in survival mode and a large amount of money spent on very expensive imported weapons i mean you look at how much one rafael jet costs you know huge amount of money if you look at the cost per rafael jet and the cost of a mig 21 decades ago when we were buying mig 21 that was the cutting edge in those days the breakthrough we needed compared to our enemies and now it's a rafael jet the ratio of price per jet is huge factor huge factor so this business of importing will it's an it's almost like it's never ending because you know by the time we have our technology domestic defense technology catch up there then that rafael will be superseded with something else we'll have to go buying that also so the, is can india catch up can india catch up given that there is a shortage of capital uh, there the time we have a huge amount of time lagging and china is not waiting for us china is just galloping way ahead so is india safe from that point of view i mean this is a big this is a big uh, military I to, i'm talking to some military generals also about it but it's a, uh, ultimately india's security is a scientific question it's a question about science and technology it is it is it's it's about science and technology along with a economically viable approach 
to dealing with these enormous asymmetries. Right. Now, there are, there are two components broadly in, in how one, uh, or, or what one needs to address. One is uh, big manufacturing, you know, whether it is jet engines or large aircraft and so on and so forth. That's manufacturing. The second component is a more uh, technologically design oriented one, which is about the avionics, for example, uh, the computer systems and so on. This latter combination, India is and can provide leadership, not just nationally, but globally. That allows a leveraging of partnerships with the other part, which requires enormous manufacturing capabilities. Yes. So that you know, tactically you are partnering first and then going on to your own manufacturing substantially. This is feasible, it's being done. And you know there are some very uh, striking examples where it's worked out well, but I think the, you know, the dramatic changes in technology over the past few years, which focuses on you know, electronic design substantially with distributed manufacturing is something which you know, many countries, companies, have used and India is beginning to use that in very intelligent ways. And the question is whether we are again renting the brains or whether we are demanding, demanding intellectual property rights. So that's the difference. See, that is a very important uh, difference. And that comes in when there are local applications or opportunities for entrepreneurs to grow and use both local markets and global markets. If you have extraordinary capability and the local markets or the local developmental possibilities are minimal, then to get a job, you will join a company which works uh, in a global manner. So the attractiveness of doing this locally must grow. It has increased in some sectors, but it needs to increase substantially in, in other sectors. Do you feel that uh, uh, as far as the impact of AI and these technologies is concerned, since we both agree that it is asymmetric and it's, everybody know, doesn't get the same benefit, benefit is available, but some people will get more. Do you feel, do you agree with my thesis that there will be uh, uh, inequalities exacerbating because maybe Bangalore will do very well with the new, uh, new technologies and new industries, but a poor place may not be able to scale up. Some poor communities may not be able to keep up with AI and, and upscale, but others will jump ahead. So the rich will get richer, poor will get poorer. This will be not only at the level of individuals, but communities, maybe regions and states and even nations. So nations may, there may be a return of colonization in a sense, because some nations will become so technologically ahead and others will become dependent. Do you feel that uh, at the level of uh, industry equal, uh, inequalities, jobs inequalities, uh, you know, unemployment and all that. Do you, do you share the concerns I have? Because I feel I've, I have huge concerns about the bottom 50% of the pyramid that the, uh, the, the, they're not being taken care of. And, and I feel that well, all, the, all my friends give me rosy reports from industry. And, you know, I come from that elite background and I'm very, very self-conscious of it. And all my friends from St. Stephen's College in all kinds of great places uh, you know, they, they don't see it like this because they read the reports of McKinsey or Pricewaterhouse or Ernst & Young or World Economic Forum. Those reports are written at the top corporate level. They go and look at corporate people are very optimistic. They will make these investments. It will be good for productivity. But what about the bottom 500 million people? What about the migrant workers? What about the going to the uh, panchayats and finding out what's going to happen to them with AI? What about going to the districts? I have not seen a single report on AI impact on India, which was done bottom up. And I've talked to economists. I've talked to well-reputed, well-known economists in good posts. And they're also just quoting uh, the top-down uh, corporate view. Uh, but the top-down corporate view will touch, you know, 10, 20% of the population. And maybe they'll do fine. But I really worry about the bottom... Five, you know, 500, 600 million Indians, what will happen to them? Uh, will they be useless Indians as Harari calls them? Useless, they call it useless people. He, call, he uses the term useless people because people's usefulness uh, in his, uh, it has to do with economic value. And if they are not able to keep up with robots and other things, then they become useless. And if they are useless, then one might as well depopulate them. But depopulating 500 million people or 600 million people in a country like India is not a joke. It's not something simple. 
So we could be heading for a what I call crash of civilization. That this is a crash of. So we are going. Yeah. No, we are we are we are going to potentially, potentially, not necessarily. Potentially, there is a route where you might have standards of living going up because communities earn by servicing global uh, requirements, but there is very little manufacturing, very little role for jobs, and service sector dominates. Now, this is, you know, going to be a very dehumanizing way of increasing standard of living. Yes. The second. issue is that you know it also needs to be dealt with in the context of other global issues such as sustainable development in the context of climate and environmental changes keep that aside but those are important factors so the question is you know, how can we avoid a dehumanizing growth where a small elite is serving doing high tech jobs for people all over the world instead of low end work and the rest of the people are part of the service industry for that and standards of living going up now this again comes back to the point which we were discussing right at the beginning unless there is a link between your earning and your production locally and your culture these are all complexities if they are there then you make for a wholesome society otherwise you know if you earn enough to buy your tv but that has no meaning with your locality and what you're doing then there is a bit of a problem but this needs to change and it can only change when our local markets our local needs and our local industry also become well paying and important for these kinds of things now that fortunately uh, through the sad last year of this pandemic has shown that distance working of a variety of kinds is much more feasible the rules and laws have changed allowing that so that if you're working for a call center you can work from anywhere you don't have to physically come to that call center and similarly for other kinds of jobs and this allows the link between people who work long distance and local economies at a finer level of granularity and if that's linked to manufacturing this you know pessimistic situation need not come to pass but you know the service sector is inherently not at the cutting edge of innovation because service doesn't have to be cutting edge of innovation so if we become a service economy my concern is that we are going away and further and further away from r&d absolutely absolutely, absolutely. this is a problem that, that uh, i'll give you an example of sorry to interrupt sure um, but i'll give you an example of you know how um, this could potentially change i'll give you first an example of many many years ago and how in some ways strangely that's coming back people such as you and i who grew up in the 1960s or 70s listening to cricket commentary on a transistor radio with our ears many of those low end transistor radios were made by self help groups in villages where you had a board and one village some people used to put on the resistors another village the capacitors third used to put the transistors and someone else used to solder them and you know used to have the board and you know someone screws the transistor radio so there was at that time something which was really high tech done on assembly line from village to village and in a routine way you could argue that people didn't understand how that worked but they were employed strangely in cutting edge technology today's world is very different today it is possible because of the availability of power as well as the availability of tools which can be driven by because of a power transistor revolution tools which can be driven quite well by low voltage you know 40 volts 48 volts dc this allows you with your computer to do two things which are extraordinary and this is happening in more urban areas but it will go to rural areas i expect with high quality computer design you can prototype anything and make it better and better and have everything detailed out on your computer then what you are exporting everywhere to the world is the design to make this object perfectly every single material what it is what is not and that's huge intellectual property i went to a factory in pune where i saw jet engine small jet engine turbines being made by subtractive machining and that whole detailing was what was exported to a jet engine manufacturing place in germany they just copied this design which was patented by this company 
they're proprietary, and they've set the machine up and that machine made those turbines. So you're no longer manufacturing small turbine blades and exporting them, you're, you're exporting the design. These are the kinds of things, I'm not saying that everything would be like this. This will link high-end manufacturing to export in a rural context. Last and quick point, you know, many years ago, um, you know, I think about 30 years ago or so, I went to a small um, Swiss village and in a big barn, there was the most exquisite machining shop far away from nowhere. And these people were making small parts which were so precise. And this was also had a farm connected, but high-end manufacturing. And these pieces were taken and packed and exported. That kind of a situation where in a most rural area, connected to what your local environment is, yet connected to the highest of technology, something which is within our grasp today. And so we must actually grasp that by education and training on scale and move it away from urban centers. I'm very glad. I'm very glad. And you use the word urban. I, I'm very glad because now I, I, I argue with many of my friends who think that the future of uh, economists, who think that the future is more and more urbanization. And I don't think that's the case. I think the ur too much urbanization has created so many problems. And, and that is not the cultural heart and the homeland of most of our people. And so we have to take the technology to where they are rather than expecting them to mi become migrant workers and come and live in ghettos in Delhi and all that place. So I'm very glad that you are, you, you, this idea of a decentralized R&D, decentralized design, take the knowledge work to the rural areas, to the smaller new communities that haven't had a participation in the past, teach them and make them part of this. And this design economy, uh, not dependent so much on uh, disc, uh, you know, kind of independent of the manufacturing economy and able to tap into the manufacturing economy, almost like treating the manufacturer like a job shop, like a like an outsourcing. You can outsource your manufacturing somewhere instead of the manufacturer outsourcing sourcing his engineering. Do you think we could have the engineering company outsource their manufacturing and the, and the engineering company own the intellectual property, own the branding, own the marketing and get the manufacturing done like from a foundry? I mean, that would be a, a role reversal, but that would be brilliant. Absolutely. That's happened in the, you know, um, um, electronic sector yes. with some of the largest company being fab, uh, foundry less fabs. You know, they get it done everywhere. Intel now, is headed that way. You can't carry that to an extreme yes. because there will be supply chain breaks which will cause problems. But a balance between manufacturing capability and distributed manufacturing and you're focusing on design is something which would be very, very valid. Given all of this that we're talking about and the solutions, do you feel India should have a population control plan? That we, we, we don't need one point, right now 1.3 billion is growing into 1.5, 1.6 billion later in the century. And it ought to be going in the other direction. I mean, if we, if we instead of 1.3 billion had 600 million, 800 million, very, very highly educated, I would say we would be a much better society. So why, why not? I mean, is this something that cannot be done because of democracy? You need the votes of all these people. <laughs> I mean, the the vote is the same for everybody in a democracy. So you know, you 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 have to pander to them. Uh, do you think that this this is a this is achievable in uh, this kind of a transition that you and I are talking about is a revolutionary transition in society, government budgeting is achievable in democracy because of because you require short term pain, you require short term pain in order to have long term gain. And this is not popular. So how do you how do you balance all the things that you and I want done? How do you balance them with the need for popularity, which is needed for democracy? So um, you know the fundamental issues here are that democracies function on relatively short lifetime uh, turnarounds. You know, governments have to um, be elected. Uh, many of the solutions to problems we talked about are long-term. Uh, so in fact, they're very long-term. And in between these two lie what society needs. They also want solutions. So there are three different trains in, uh, you know, going at three different sp speeds. The slow speed of technological and scientific development, which 
is very rapid at the end point, but takes a long time to go through. Society wants solutions in terms of a year, two year basis. And you know, those who are elected want something happening every weekend almost, you know? So how do these three trains communicate with each other? So I think we need interface structures which flit between these three trains and carry both ideas and material back and forth so that each can do at their own pace, but there's communication between these three. To have any train not there would mess up society rather substantially. All three need to be there. And it's always, it's been a long challenge throughout history, the balance between these three. Um, and it's very difficult in a world where there's turmoil, which can come externally beyond your control to have only internal systems to balance all of this. So there are too many variables, too many boundary conditions. It's not easy to predict, but overall balanced economic development, good neighborliness, uh, balance of trade, all of these make for uh, a more stable environment. The economists you talked about, they have constantly been linearly extrapola uh, extrapolating from the first industrial revolution. Right. Now that is not a correct thing to do. You know, uh, everything doesn't really uh, linearly extrapolate. And I think now there's a flip possible that we can have a more distributed balanced structures of various kinds. Yeah, I think that the AI revolution like the industrial revolution will bring some discontinuities and a lot of classical thinking, traditional thinking, established thinking in economics, in social sciences, uh, in, in policy making is all going to be disruptive. And so uh, for, a, for a kind of a, a researcher and, and writer like me, it's very exciting. But for uh, the human being in me and uh, Bharatiya, it's also sad. I, I, feel, I really worry. Uh, while during the day when I'm writing all this stuff, I feel very excited, you know, this great new original thought and breakthrough, we'll have a lot of discussions. But then when I go to bed, I also worry for my countrymen. Uh, and, and I really seriously wonder, I wonder if the, I know a few top leaders are very good and they, they are plugged in. But I, I look at the social media as a barometer of what the Aam Admi is being fed by what he thinks are leaders the thought leaders in YouTube who got these channels and the Twitter atties and all their monthans and literary fest festivals and all that, they are totally ignorant about all this. Uh, in, fact, uh, in fact, when I keep getting invites to come and speak here and there, when I talk about AI, they don't, they, they tell you, hey, AI, what AI, you know, they think it's some kind of science fiction or maybe it's some kind of a nerdy I'm technocrat, right? Telling them about some programming. They haven't understood the importance of AI in the total revolution of social sciences. I mean, the study of society, the social sciences, uh, uh, you know, sociology, all of that, political thought, how to, how to govern, uh, all of that is going to be so dramatically changed by, by this new, uh, new kind of economy. People are in their comfort zone in India. And, and I feel that that is very dangerous, that the ruling elite of all, all kinds of professions and institutions are in a comfort zone, uh, Vishwa Guru. I mean, I don't, I don't think, I don't believe that uh, India is a Vishwa Guru or in the next 20, 20 years. I think it's a hard work. We got to really work our way hard out of all this. So what are your thoughts on the struggle ahead, the tapasya ahead, rather than this uh, lofty talk that we have? You know, uh, what has happened worldwide is a feedback loop, which has increased in which has resulted in substantial polarization of viewpoints. Uh, and that results in people with those viewpoints talking to those who agree with those viewpoints. So you have you know, two widely separated sets of viewpoints, for example, talking to each other and reinforcing each other. And then the conversation between these two or multiple viewpoints, which is the actually the core of Indian discussions always, yes. that becomes absent. Yes. So then I would say there is great value in each of us exploring multiple viewpoints, yes. not just our own. Yes. And that's been a substantial tradition in discussions in India, yes. where you present logically the strengths of different viewpoints and then from that distill a viewpoint which you think is value in a particular context. 
that kind of a calm discussion is what is needed otherwise you know the social media world where in 280 characters you're supposed to say your viewpoint and then you're labeled one or the other is a big challenge yes i want to create a, a, a conference two day conference on ai and uh, take each of the five battlegrounds and have uh, take each of the five battlegrounds and have a thematic discussion have a I panel it's a very good idea you know the niti ayog has got the convening capacity to get people across the spectrum and i will work with them and arrange a meeting where we can discuss this across it will be really very good i think uh, it will be very very valuable as we go forward so vijay raghavan this has been a pleasure i mean you are a, you Absolutely. are a, you are a very Likewise. rare person because you are brilliant in thinking you have got a tremendous background in scientific thinking uh, you have your heart in the right place you can also think out of the box uh, you are thinking about the com- common people uh, you understand the diversity and complexity you're not saying these are easy answers you're not saying here is a one liner everything is done you recognize the hard work to be done the path ahead is tough uh, but we have to do it Uh, and, and so you know i really feel honored and uh, to be able to s- spend this time and discuss with you uh, uh, i think india needs uh, this exactly this kind of thinking and i i hope the government is listening to you uh, i i believe they are i think it's it's been a wonderful discussion and your book both in the two major sections about what the world is like and how it relates to india in the most rooted sense and finally the appendices on how different peoples and their viewpoints are and you know how that relates to practicalities i think these are very important it's well researched and there's a you know treasure of documentation as i said i i like to read uh, the hard copy but i also got the kindle version because i can search and go back and forth in in different areas so it's been a very valuable read and very valuable in the context of the many things we're doing and you know as i said a little while before uh, these are the kinds of discussions and debates which sharpen us in terms of being able to get things done and for that i'm very grateful and thank you very very much for having me here today thank you so much thank you very much thank you thank you namaste thank you, thank you. Thank you.